Next up, we have Anne Verhollen, uh, who's going to be sharing with us on uh, water infiltration on in soils. Anne is a soil science graduate from the University of Guelph. We've had many Guelph uh, people today, which is great. That's where I did my undergrad. Uh, Anne has worked for OMAFRA since 1988, starting as a soil conservation advisor working in Essex and Kent. Currently, Anne works in the area of horticultural soil management with projects in a wide variety of soil management areas, such as erosion, compaction, and water management. Promoting the use of cover crops and supporting better health, soil health are definitely some of her passions. We'll get Anne to share her screen. I know she was here a moment ago. Uh, I'm here now. Oh, Just good. Sure, I want to continue. Uh, let's see. If you did want to still um, share a video, because I know you had thought about that, just make sure you hit just, that little. Yep, I did now. Perfect. Perfect. Apparently, you can see my screen now, right? Yes. yes. Now, let's see. Slideshow from current slide. And then now we'll find out which screen you're actually watching. And everything is slow today. I do not understand. So. Perfect. We can see it um, on full screen. Okay, lovely. Oh, okay. Just to keep track of my time. <clears throat> so, um, Jess asked me to talk about water infiltration. And a lot of this is coming out of, <laughs> I think out of the wild weather we've had for the last couple of years. So let's dive right into that because really what I wanna talk about is not just water infiltration, but actually building a better sponge. So, and if you remember back in June, they got it kind of right, this weather forecast, but not really. So anybody that's down in my area, you can see that we're this lovely uh, ready orange color and they were predicting that we'd get two inches. There's a swath through there that got anywhere from three to almost 12 inches. And under those kind of conditions, it doesn't matter what you've done. Uh, there's only so much of that water that you're going to capture. And that's, that's an issue, but um, it's, like I said, we had some heavy rainfall and a lot of floods and a lot of crop damage in, in Chatham-Kent, uh, particularly through the Dresden area. Hit a lot of tomato farms. And the thing is last year, it just didn't stop, right? There was areas that were very dry in the province, but the area that was getting rain just kept getting it. And it seemed like um, every weekend we had rain and it didn't come just as a little bit, it came as an inch or two at a time. So that becomes a real challenge in trying to manage water on the farm. And it seems to be more common. And you can see that even nature has started to look at what the impact of all this rain has as far as economic growth. Uh, I know it was definitely severe in our area and not just uh, for tomato growers, but also for soybeans. And it's amazing. You can look at the maps that are, have recently come out from AgriCorps that show terrific yields in this area too. And yet there's this little band that looks really tough. Some of it is sand soils, but some of it is, the, is that band of rain that went through and just set us up for some real problems for the rest of the year. So let's, let's take a step back and talk about soil. So if we were in person, I would probably drag out my handy dandy bucket and have some bricks and some sponges and do that basic demonstration of, you know, they're both porous substances. And in a lot of ways, a brick looks a whole lot more like our soils than a sponge. But when we're talking about water and air, what we really want is a soil that is a sponge that when we have um, adverse weather or a tough harvest like this past year, that you can drive across it and it bounces back and that it's still basically the same shape. Whereas a brick is a lot more brittle and if we compress it too far, it breaks. Not to mention that there's a huge density difference too, but uh, it's nice to think of 
our soil as a sponge. And there are, you know, typically I would also play with the sponges and we'd take a look at the different water holding capacity, whether we were compacted or not. And if we were in person, I probably would drag out something like this, maybe not in, a, in an arena, but if we were outside, we would bring out our, our large rain, rainfall simulator. This is such a cool piece of equipment and I've really missed it the last couple of years. Here's from, I think this was 2019 and it was a uh, drainage workshop in field demonstrations and things like that. And what I wanted to point out, cause I'm gonna show you, hopefully show you a little video clip. So this is a rainfall simulator. You can see that it is applying water uh, up above there. You can see that there's a pressure and a sprayer nozzle that goes back and forth. At one time, I would have said that this is like hurricane type force rain. After this past year, it actually fits fairly well with some of the rainstorms we've had go through. Then if you look across the table, you'll see that there's five different slabs of soil. These soil slabs are, are collected in situ. Um, it's actually fairly time consuming because we're trying to get them undisturbed as much as possible. So that if there is any macropore development that it's intact. And if there's roots, they're intact. And if you look across this, you may or may not, depending on what you're watching this on, be able to see that we've got a, a here and clay loam from a natural area. This actually has quite a, you'll see it in the video. It has quite a, a mulch layer with, with leaves on top. It's undisturbed. And if you were to break it open, it has the most amazing structure. It just looks like chocolate cake. And then we go into a three crop rotation with a fair bit of tillage, a good rotation that's lower tillage. You can see that at the middle one has a lot more residue on top. And then a silty clay loam that's got a crop rotation with hay and low tillage, and it's actually in its hay phase there. And a similar soil, again, silty clay loam with a corn, uh, continuous corn and full tillage. Now with these rainfall simulators, we capture both runoff and um, the water that is actually infiltrated or gone through that little profile that we've got there. So if you look, you'll see there's these uh, plastic barrels hanging underneath. The ones that are stuck underneath, that is capturing uh, the water that's coming off these trays. All those trays have holes in the bottom and then they go into a sub tray and that channels any of that water that's been infiltrated. And then we've got a little weir that captures any of the runoff. So the front set of barrels that are hanging there are actually the runoff. The back ones are the infiltration. And you can see even with a little bit of running that we've done there, there is some differences. So let's see if I can get my uh, video to run if I did this correctly. We'll see. So this is just the same set of samples looking at it from the opposite side. You can see the leaf tissue. You can see the residue a little bit better in that center one. There we go. You'll probably be able to hear all the background noise. That's really not a problem. So just having a good time watching it. It's a spectacular demonstration we get to see it in person. Okay, sorry, I just checked the chat just in case you can't hear me because I can't tell. Uh, these are fantastic. And you can see that we've got a difference here in terms of runoff. If you look across that front group, that's all the runoff barrels, you can see that the high tillage areas have a lot more runoff. That means we've got poorer infiltration. And we certainly saw a lot of runoff this past year with some of those severe weather um, events. Okay. And it's funny because we almost take it as a given that headlands are going to hold water. And here's Ray Archuleta. He's the soil guy. Uh, we had him up many years ago for the Soil Smart program. And he is such a passionate advocate for better soil health. And I loved his comment. We don't have a runoff problem. We have an inf infiltration problem. And that is so true. And there's a lot of things that have changed over the years. So let's explore that a little bit more. Here's a diagram that I pulled from uh, an article. It's actually 
uh, the session at the Ag Conference pointed me towards this article. And it's really very insightful, I think, because what they did, this is from some soil survey work in Iowa. So I realized not our soils, but it gives you an indication and it, it kind of goes with my life experience. So they were looking at the soil descriptions from the 30s to the 60s and then resampled some of these and looked and described these profiles again. And the thing that I think is critical to look at here when we're thinking about infiltration is the structure at the surface. How, how well how well structured was that soil to allow water to come in? So you can see that back in the 50s, there's that kind of hatched area that's very deep. And whereas when they sampled in 2007, they'd lost seven centimeters and the area that was a granular structure. So that chocolate cake, that fine tilth, that's, that's more like what you wanna put a seed into, they'd lost seven centimeters and it still was much, much narrower, much more shallow than what had been there in the 50s. And that kind of makes sense because if you look back in the 50s and the early 60s, a lot of those farms that they surveyed would have looked totally different. And it, there would have been a lot more mixed agriculture, um, possibly uh, much smaller tractors, of course, and some other things that all contribute to structure. If you're looking for some more in-depth, I'd really point you toward the Ag Conference to the Soil Water 101. It's a fantastic session, really well done. There's some other things that have changed and I think this also impacts our water infiltration. So again, this is from Ontario, this is 1955. And I believe this is up somewhere not too far off of Lake Huron. I've borrowed it so many times, I've forgotten exactly where it comes from. But you can see that we have a high percentage of pasture and forage forest that about a third of it is in pasture and forest and the other two thirds are actually in row crop. Now let's fast forward to 2006. So it actually matches up with that other sample really, really well. And you can see that that whole area has changed. We have much fewer forest areas. We don't really have pasture other than a little bit of space around the houses. We've lost all those uh, fence rows and field dividers. So all those things that help to slow down water when we get those big gully washer type rains are gone. So between what we're doing to our soil structure and what we've done to the overall landscape, it's changed how well we can actually infiltrate water. So Ray's really right. It's not a runoff problem. We have an infiltration problem. And we've been hearing for a long time that our soil organic matter is changing. And it's, it's thrilling for me what Laura's doing and the fact that she's seeing organic matter levels increasing and then tying that to increased yields. Because if there's anything that should drive adoption, it should be that you've got a return on it. We know that we've seen um, reduction in organic matter level over time, particularly in the Southwest on some soil types that really need as much organic matter as possible. And this is a pretty much a generalization. And here's some more recent information. This is from the uh, Ontario Topsoil Survey. And so Dan surratt has been leading that up. And I think it's interesting to see what they've picked up. So they've got it broken out by soil texture. You can see that there's sandy, sandy loams, loams, clay loams, and clays. And we have a target soil organic matter and we have an actual. And so the target comes from the Ontario uh, Soil Health and Conservation Strategy that uh, Deb was referencing earlier this morning. And the targets are in there as something to shoot for. The organic matters that they are actually measuring with this topsoil survey are mm, showing that other than the sandy soils, maybe we've Dan maintains we've hit the target or set the target too low for our sandy soils. But for all these other ones, we're not quite hitting that target and we're a bit short on organic matter. And that does have a part to play in structure and infiltration. And what else has been changing? The other thing ha has been changing goes around with how bulky our soils are. So if you think about, um, 
bulk density as a, as a way of measuring compaction or how firm our soils are. And when we have firmer soils, we're starting to get closer to that brick than that sponge that I was talking to about at the beginning. And you can see that what Dan's put here is that the critical values he's come up with from literature for bulk density um, are 1.35 for fine soils, 1.45 for medium and coarse, it's 1.6. Kind of makes sense because that relates back to the mineral material there and the pore sizes. And so our coarse sandy soils tend to, um, we can pack them a fair bit before we really start seeing a lot of problems. But those, those critical values means at that point, we start seeing interference with root, um, root expansion and through the field, through the soil. So we do see that we've got some issues here with bulk density, it has been increasing. And this is the thing with the topsoil survey, this isn't research trials, this isn't uh, you know, large regional estimations. These are samples that have been taken from Southern Ontario and they're directed to take them from various fields based on an algorithm. So it's not just all the dairy farmers or just all the um, cash crop farmers. It's done by the algorithm. So it tells you where to go. I've done some of the sampling and you basically cold call somebody and ask if you can sample their field. So this is an interesting way of uh, getting a different way of looking at what's really going on and what the averages are. So bulk density means that we have less pore space. So let's take a look at, you probably, some of you have probably seen this one before, and it's a CT um, scan of a soil block before and after compacting activity. And I use it quite often when I'm talking about compaction or talking about the need for pore space. And there's two things to notice here. So right off the bat, what do you see? And I'd love to put it in the chat. And maybe we will try that. Okay. So what do you see here? You all can pretty much put something in the chat real quick. What do you see is the difference between the pre-impact and the post-impact? What has changed with the pores that are in this soil block? Come on, take a chance. Oh, lovely, Shannon. That's fantastic, because that's usually the last thing anybody mentions. Usually the first thing is we don't see as many pores, period. And what we have are small, very fine pores. And you're right, itty bitty pores on the right, lots of smaller pores, exactly. Lots of smaller pores, and as we get into those smaller pores, they hold water so much more tightly that it's usually not available to the plant. So we're starting to make whatever that soil is into even more nasty a clay if it was a clay. And Shannon is totally right. There's a, a huge loss of connected pores and those connected pores are really important for water infiltration and moving water through the soil. And when you think about, oh, come on, I'm on the wrong spot. Why don't we just do that? Overall block is not as tall, correct. Yep, yep, that's right. We've compacted it. We've got a lot finer, finer pores. And it's interesting that out of this one research uh, paper, it talked about our present day field traffic risk, creating a bottleneck. And I'd never thought of it exactly that way, but I thought you, you're right, a bottleneck. And we all understand that, that We've, we are creating a bottleneck for getting water through the soil. We can tile all we want, but if we can't get the water to the tile, it's not working for us. And I like throwing this one in because it's just a little bit fun. It's not like water falls from the sky. Oh, wait, it does. How can we help get it back into the ground? So let's take a little bit harder look at some of the macro pore concepts or the pore concepts, period. So, you know, we have macro pores, mesopores, micro pores, all of that changes how water moves in the soil. But the key part here, I think, for our water infiltration is to look at the macro pores. And when they represent at most 1% of all the soil pores in most soils. But 
they're contributing up to 70% of the actual water movement. So if you think about it, if you can look really close at the little CT scan that's over to the left-hand side there, you can, see, you can see some labels that show an earthworm burrow and a root channel. Those are our macropores. And we've talked about macropores and preferential flow for a while, usually in terms of fertilizer and manure, but that all takes water to move it. So if we want to get better water infiltration, we do need macropores and we need them connected. We can manage those other things to prevent damage to the environment, but we need those macropores in place. And one way to prove this to yourself, if you ever wanna do this, this is just blue dye. We've done some of this more with irrigation studies actually, but you can see that we'll get that wetting that moves as a whole front. You can see the blue has gone down to a certain point. There's our bottleneck, right? Right, you can see where there's almost a shelf. And then after that, we just see tendrils coming down. And those tendrils are the macropores. And in a lot of cases, they'll be the earthworm channels. So how can we build a better sponge? Well, this is mom and apple pie. This is all the soil health things we've been talking about. So using a better crop rotation. So here's some samples from the Alora Research Station. Both are upland soils. One has got sod, the other one's corn. If you look at the aggregates, the aggregates are very, very different. We've got much better structure under a sod. All those fine root uh, hairs have built, all those root exudates, all that carbon that's cycling we know that it's built better structure. And some of you have probably seen this either with myself or possibly with Adam Hayes or even the local conservation authority, looking at aggregate stability. And actually these samples are from the long-term rotation and tillage trial that Dave Hooker manages. And I think you can probably guess those cloudy ones where the aggregates are not as stable you can probably guess which treatments those are. And if you guess something with a fair bit of tillage and a very restricted rotation that probably has a lot of soybeans in it, you'd be right. Whereas the ones on the right-hand side are the ones with less tillage. They've got a more diverse rotation. So we've got things like wheat, just like what Laura was talking about, where we've got living roots, more returns of carbon to the soil over time and supporting that biology to build that uh, lovely, lovely structure that's very stable. It still breaks down, but you can see we don't have it blowing apart into fine pieces and making that cloudy, cloudy so water in there. The other thing, we can expand those crop rotations. And I loved hearing all the conversation about cover crops this morning. That was so awesome. You guys are just so knowledgeable and so enthusiastic and seeing the change. So if you, uh, you can see the change that it can make in soil structure, and if nothing else, things like radish, anything with a larger uh, tap root is gonna leave some of these lovely big holes that used to be a radish there. And it does make a difference. Anytime we have a cover crop, it's gonna make a difference in water infiltration. This is some really old stuff that Adam Hayes and I did as part of one of our tier two projects with the soil and crop. And it's showing drainage under uh, radish, oats, and with no cover crop at all. And if you look at that, sorry for the dog noise, if you look at that initial drainage, so we want as short a time as possible, you can see that it didn't matter. As long as we had a cover crop, didn't matter which one it was, they did a good job. If we had nothing, we tended to pond and not drain as quickly. Now with the radish, you'll see that we actually had water that went into those holes and just sat there for a while. So it looks like it drained. It's still in the soil. It will be absorbed over time. So it still does its job as long as we don't have too much radish and end up with some tile problems. And you can see here's that radish root. It rots away. We've got this almost column of, of emptiness that we can put water into early in the spring or late in the fall. Another way to build a better sponge, again, reducing tillage. And if we reduce tillage, improve our rotations, we're going to support more earthworms. So those little middens that are on the right-hand side, you can see a midden. That's going to act as a bunch of different little dams. It's going to, yes, they've, they've taken your lovely spread residue 
and piled it up into these little beaver dams all over the field. And yeah, it's left some of the area bare, but those are going to act as little dams to slow water as it moves across the field. And then we've got things like what Blake here is holding, which is uh, one of our earthworm molds and figure he's on the, some of that heavy Brookston clay soils where he's done very little tillage in the last 20 years plus. And you can see that we've got root, we've got root channels and earthworm channels that are going down almost as tall as he is. And I have to admit, I pulled those out and I get frustrated at a certain point. So I pulled them, they're broken. They went actually much further than that. And kudos to him for getting a, a, a backhoe in to help with my digging. Otherwise I would have got frustrated a whole lot sooner. The other part I think we have to think about in building this better sponge, it's not just our soil, it's also the rest of the field. So we can build soil structure, but then when we get those heavier rains that just it's a little too much for our soil to take, or you know, as water comes in on our soil, it will take so much and then those cracks and those fissures start to close in a bit and it slows down the amount of water then it's really important to have residue management that we've got lots of residue to slow that water down, to have cover crops to slow the water down, buffer strips again, to help absorb anything where we've got crop that's growing, whether it's a buffer strip or a tree border, it's going to absorb more water and buffer us as, in terms of uh, absorbing and infiltrating water and making that better sponge for the whole landscape. And I know it's not always going to work. I know it's not. There's going to be times where you get those six inch rains, where we get a thunderstorm that circles on top of us. And there's not a lot we can do about that. All we can do is try and prime our soils as best possible. So that means building that better sponge so that it will take most of that water. And just like Laura was talking about with the dry year and the wet year and the response excuse me, the response in yield with her plots. Some of that, it's because it is drought proofing those soils. It's holding some more moisture and it's allowing those roots to go farther. So we can build a better sponge and hopefully drought proof ourselves by doing a number of those different practices. And do they pay in one year? No, they pay over time. You have to think about it as a maintenance schedule. You have a maintenance schedule for things in your house, like your furnace, for your tractors, for your pickup trucks, for our transport. There's all those maintenance schedules. A lot of these things are really a maintenance piece for your soil. Okay, any questions? Comments? Thanks, Laura. Uh, Laura, I, I was reading. <laughs> and <laughs> you can't imagine how many times that happens. <laughs> no, that was great. If anyone has a question, definitely feel free to chime in. Uh, Tracy Ryan did have a comment that and your images and comments on the landscape are impactful. Um, and uh, Colin said earlier that that was a fun seven inch rain at the very beginning of your presentation talking about last summer. Uh, interesting times attempting to reverse irrigate fields. So yes. yeah, it very much last, so. last summer was pretty crazy. Um, I had a question. Um, if you have a lot of compaction and you're someone starting out in cover crops, would you suggest the radish only because it kind of goes down those deep those like puts down those deep tap roots or throw a mix at it from the start? Well, I have to admit, I really liked what Jen and Deb were talking about at the beginning with the cover crop coaches, because it's often those very simplistic questions that you get. They seem simple, but you need to dive into it a little bit more because then my Next question is, what else are you doing? Why else are you wanting to plant a cover crop? Where do you think it's gonna fit? What's your soil type? What kind of equipment do you have available? Because yeah, right, radish might not be the right one. And truthfully, if I wanted, I can find lots of pictures where radish is going sideways if there's bad compaction problems. Usually we're trying to, to break up a number of different things. So I have seen good success with, with radish, but I don't like to use it by itself 
itself. We're going to do it. Let's do it in combination with something like an oat or a rye. So we've got the fibrous root system. Again, it depends on how it fits. The other thing that's working well for some people is some of the warm season grasses like sorghum sudan. Uh, it will root deeper, especially as you cut it over the course of the summer. But again, it depends on where does it fit? How does it fit into your system? So that does take a little bit of coaching. Totally. Don McCabe? Thank you, Jess. And uh, as you uh, are going around the countryside, uh, like myself, and uh, uh, there's been tremendous amount of uh, tillage done yet in months that we would normally not be out there because of the fall we've had. Yes, we've had tremendous yields, but are, how much damage are we doing right now uh, deep ripping these soils at these moisture conditions? And is this just uh, our, our cover crops going to be able to come back and uh, uh, rehabilitate that mess? Or uh, was all this mechanical stuff really needed after the compaction that our soils saw in this fall's harvest? Thank you. Wow, Don, that's, that's a long discussion over a cup of coffee. Um, managing compaction is a longer term thing in my mind. So yeah, we, we had the harvest season from, from hell in some places. Um, and yeah, I, I applaud the guys who were able to wait and run on frost or frozen because I think they did themselves a good service. I can understand the, the need or desire to use tillage to cover up a lot of things. Um, if you're trying to deep, there, there was no time that you could do any deep ripping this fall, at least not in Southwestern Ontario, I don't think. Uh, you're gonna do some smearing. Is that a big problem? I think it depends on where your soil was to start with. How healthy and resilient was it to begin with? Because again, that healthy, resilient soil, it is simplistic to say it's a sponge, but a sponge does bounce back. And I think a soil that's in good shape to begin with didn't suffer as much and will bounce back from um, the stresses that we put on it this fall. I am much more concerned about some of these other soils that maybe are struggling to begin with, and especially some of our heavier soils where we walk a fine line anyways. Um, but those over time, yeah, we can improve them. Sure we can, but it takes time, it takes patience. And I think if you've ever heard Ian or Alex talk about compaction, Ian especially, he'll talk about patience. 